seeking truth from facts. A catchphrase in the Chinese political vocabulary has its origin in the prestigious Yuelu Academy. It's from here in Changsha, capital of Hunan province, that you join us to rediscover the Chinese dream. Changsha is associated with the political upheavals in the early years of Mao Zedong and is known as the cradle of the Chinese Enlightenment movement or the New Democratic Revolution in the early 20th century. National heroes and the very first pioneers of China's modernization program like Tan Tong, Chai Hesen and Mao Zedong were all seeking to build a strong and modern China right from here. Their revolutionary spirit filled the 1911 revolution, overthrowing the last dynasty of China and ushering in the first republic of the country. So it's not surprising that the Yuanlu Academy is inspiring the dream of China's national rejuvenation. We have the right to dream. Imagine a good life. The question is, how do you express it? We don't express ourselves in uh, unreflective nationalistic sentiments. I'm Canadian and we love to criticize the U.S. Who are those who said no? I hope in China 10 years from now, people can say, I was born poor, but I can be a millionaire. Hello and welcome to Dialogue Special coming to you from the Yuelu Academy, Hunan Province. I'm Yang Rui. Hunan is home to two presidents of the PRC, Mao Zedong and Liu Xiaoqi. Today, we are on a journey to define Chinese dream. The dream comes out of a rediscovery of a changing China. It's time to reflect upon history and look ahead to the future. But how will China present its dream to the rest of the world as a major responsible stakeholder without causing worries about exporting China threat? Today we are honored to be joined here by four brilliant panelists. They are Daniel Bell, Zhang Xidong, Nalapart, and Anna Townsend. Daniel Bell, the first ever Western scholar to become a full-time faculty in political philosophy at China's most prestigious universities. With a unique, insightful, and rich perspective on the Confucian values in contemporary Chinese society, he is the master on the West and East dialogue. Zhang Xidong, a leading interpreter of modern Chinese literature and culture, his work on aesthetic and critical theory, including his pioneering translation of Walter Benjamin, has been a source of inspiration for a generation of Chinese intellectuals since 1990s. Andy Nalapart, the man who has no formal role in the Indian government, but influences policy at the highest levels. Now, he holds the UNESCO Peace Chair and professor of the Manipur University in India. Anna Tangan, an American with Korean blood, from Milwaukee to Beijing. He took only eight years to be a real Chinese hand. As a businessman and a writer, he observes China in both ways. And today we are also joined by two special guest speakers and commentators. They are Professor Zhu Weiming. Zhu Weiming, the world's leading Confucian scholar, a spokesman for New Confucianism. He inherited the traditional Asian values and promoted the modernization of Confucianism. Now, he is a lifetime professor at Peking University, research professor at Harvard, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Last but not least, Mr. Ang Jianfei, mayor of Changsha, the host city. Zhang Jianfei, mayor of the host Changsha city in Hunan province in central China. Having gained a PhD at Berkeley, worked at the World Bank, he is endowed with impeccable academic qualifications as well as abundant work experience in international organizations. Growing up with China's reforms, he himself is one good example of the Chinese dream. He is also ready and determined to help the 7 million citizens of the Changsha city to realize their dreams. 
Welcome to Dialogue Special. Let me begin with a simple question for all of the four distinguished guest speakers, but I expect to have a quick answer as to your definition about the Chinese dream. Daniel Bell. There's this view that the Chinese dream is more collectivist, but I think it's more that um, there are many different social relations that matter for China. The family, relations within the country, relations between the country, and relations between humans and nature. And I think within all those relations, uh, we want to have a harmonious kind of relation. So if I had to summarize one interpretation of the China dream, that's how I would summarize it. Now, Jiang Xidong is a uh, cultural vision based on uh, a more socially, economically concrete concept of Chinese way. But here is the, uh, now is the historical moment for the Chinese to, to talk about culture, meaning, significance, value, uh, beyond uh, the purely economic and the socially uh, uh, concrete program. Professor Nalapart. Well, I think, you know, you need a certain amount of confidence to dream. And China, like so many other countries in Asia, has suffered a lot for many centuries. I think the Chinese dream indicates that finally the Chinese people realize that they are as good as anybody else and they can be as successful as anybody else. They have not only the right to dream, but they have a duty to dream. Now, Anna Tangan. Uh, I will go last and, of course, least. All I can say about the Chinese dream is that it is both individual and what we would call aspirational. That means that your dreams as individuals must fit into a larger framework of dreams that guide the country. Don't tell but show. Let's take a quick look at the footage that may unveil how we look at the Chinese dream. China grows, so do aspirations for its young people. But dreams are different. The flying goddess transcends Dugong Caves to become a divine boat in orbit. Career success, happiness and liberty. Most Chinese pursue dreams similar to people from other cultures and continents. President Xi Jinping foresees and oversees China as a modern world power resuming the glories of a nation of civilization and that is the dream of the new Chinese leadership. Well, that's it. In his broad assessment about Chinese dream, Mr. Xi Jinping, our newly elected president, uh, visited the National Museum following the uh, 18th National Congress of the CPC, the Peaceful Power Transfer, and he came up with the idea of sloganeering of the new generation of the leadership about Chinese dream. And he stopped deliberately in the section, the particular section about the national rejuvenation. In a culture that's likely to look to the past to tell the future, what do you think of uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's version about the Chinese dream? We start with uh, Professor Tu Weiming. Well, I think uh, Xi Jinping's idea of the regeneration of uh, the Chinese culture uh, is to understand China as, not as a civilization state with a great deal of uh, cultural resource and serve as a moral leadership for the global community in the 21st century. To set a good example for the rest of the world as a major responsible stakeholder, as I said in the opening remarks, but Mayor Zhang, you know, many of the overseas articles were very critical and cynical about the uh, dream of China, saying this is none other than an expression about the rise of nationalism, and they say this is pretty scary and would make our neighboring countries a few nervous. What do you think of this kind of allegation? Well, uh, I think we have the right to dream and we have the responsibility to dream. A rich people and a strong country, this is uh, our responsibility. I think the, str the strong the China does not necessarily mean that we have caused some uh, anxieties to the neighboring countries. I mean, there are so many countries in the world they are very strong, but yet uh, people are not very furious about them. So why should they worry about this? What do you think, Anna? Dreams are what we aspire to, but they're not necessarily something that come easy. They require sacrifice, years of dedication. And this is the balance point. You can't have a society where everything, you want things, but you have to be prepared to work for them. And I think this is the larger context of what she is saying. A, a strong China is a China that is inclusive of and keeps 
the forces which are currently tearing the world apart, the factionalism, tribalism, uh, keeps China on a road towards prosperity. Well, I'd like to go back to what the mayor was saying. When China rises, the rest of the world should also rise. Now, we have seen cultures and civilizations. When they rose, the rest of the world was oppressed, suppressed. For example, when India finally became free in 1947, about 93% of the country was illiterate. It had very high death rates and very, very abysmal poverty. So China rising means the world rising. And I think that's the significance. And that's why the China dream ought to be different from dreams in the past of certain cultures that have made zero sums so common. But there is, as a counterpoint to that, there is always this thing that as, as powers come and go, there is friction. And this is inevitable. The question is how you handle it and how our dreams uh, both here in China and the rest of the world can be brought together. So it's not an easy task. Well, I would uh, they say it's relatively easy in case you have a civilizational culture that takes harmony at the core rather than dominating people through the use of force. You know, you can influence people through argument, through discussion, and you can influence them through the use of force. I think it's very, very important that China accept Chinese methods of influencing the world and not, if I may say so, Western methods of influencing the world. Here, we have to have a sort of a historical sense. I mean, the dreams are both timeless and historically conditioned. The different generations have very different dreams. Standing here, looking at the Yue Lu Shuya, I cannot help uh, uh, thinking about another constitutional reformer, Yang Du, who is from uh, Hunan, who has this famous line, if uh, China is Germany, then Hunan is Prussia. So, which means we will unify China, we will make China strong. Those kind of, a, it's also a version of a Chinese dream, but that kind of a Chinese dream, historically speaking, was driven by a sense of humiliation. But the new Chinese dream, I think, is really about a kind of a newfound freedom. Now it's the time for Chinese people to imagine a good life for the first time in, in the history of modern China, I would say. Is that your version about the emancipation of the mind? I'd like to just carry it down to a slightly realistic level and talk about global market competition. Because ultimately, as you know, it's all about money. It's all about profit. Hopefully and in that, situation, <laughs> no, in that situation today, Chinese companies are 30 to 40 percent cheaper in their products than companies in certain other countries. So it is advantageous to portray China as a hegemon, as a threat, so that people turn away from Chinese companies. It's in a way competing Without, uh, without going into the commercial sphere. Because commercially, Chinese companies over the last 10 years especially have also ramped up their high tech very significantly. Uh, yeah, but this, this is absolutely, uh, this is one of the myths that thing. The decision to move jobs to China was not done by Chinese companies or the Chinese government. It was done by our executives sitting in boardrooms across the United States who said it's cheaper to be there. So. I, I always uh, take uh, issue with this I'm idea that somehow China took it. It was our own decision. I'm not talking if you regret it, it's ours. So I'm not talking of 1983. I'm talking of 2013, when Chinese products are competing even in the so-called developed markets. It's a big change in the last 30 years. Uh, Professor Narapa, uh, I appreciate your emphasis on the importance of money and economics. But I think the vision of Chinese dream now is much broader. It's not just economic. It's political, it's social, it's cultural, and even ecological. So in that sense, the ability to find a way that involves a lot of people in this enterprise is not just a zero-sum game of economic competitiveness. You know, Professor, I'm against zero-sum games. And I would also like to stress that if you want clean air, if you want clean ecology, if you want a better life, unfortunately, you still need money for that. I mean, you know, you can't get clean air from present day, you need to make money. So only at a certain stage of development do people's lives begin developing. And there, yes, I raise the point about equity, about fairness. You know, in America in the past, people could say, I was born poor, but I can be a millionaire. But today, I'm not sure if we can say that anymore about the United States. In inequality is rising. I hope in China 10 years from now, people can say, I was born poor, but I can be a millionaire. I hope everybody in China can say that. Is the American dream necessarily about absolute individualism? It's the pursuit of individual uh, career success at the cost of the collective will. And does it mean that everything has to be 
Every policy has to be formulated uh, at the congressional hearing. It got to be approved by a majority of the lawmakers. Uh, unless until that's made possible, you won't construct a high-speed railway. Then efficiency is sacrificed. What do you think of, say, the collective will and respect for the individual, uh, I mean, wishes? Yeah, I don't think uh, you could characterize American uh, dream as a really individualistic. Uh, Americans do care about education, about their family, a larger community, their country. Uh, Americans do love their country. I think Chinese dream raises a world historical opportunity or question. That is whether, uh, you know, American dream we all understand it's also about upward mobility, right? But in China, in India, in uh, large parts of the so-called third world, people are moving from the bottom. And the, the equal opportunity in America or in Western Europe is built on historically achieved society, successful society, as a result of a bourgeois revolution, religious reforms, you know, and economic re innovations for centuries. And so you have this discrepancy uh, uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of access, in terms of basic conditions. But in China, and as well as in India, you have the large population trying to make it, that would create a, a different sense of, uh, a different definition of, of, of success. And it changes the, the so-called lord and the bondsman relationship. It's the bondsman, the workers, the laborers, who have to know more, who have to understand that it's their labor, through their labor, through their production, they are changing the world and changing the rules of the game. And this, I think, is the political and the social substance of, of the Chinese dream, or Indian dream. Well, I, I do believe that religious freedom, political freedom, upward social mobility, these are ordinary American dreams. But now the real challenge, too, since 9-11, the sense of security, now especially with the Boston bombing, the sense of security, which of course is something that we take absolutely seriously in China. It's very pronounced. Therefore, how can we have a secure, peaceful, and stable world in which we can develop ourselves become a very common dream in America as well as in China? But are you aware, gentlemen, that the absolute security of a country means the absolute insecurity of all others? And that right. means you're going to become a very hegemonic. You become the superpower. So we not only appreciate the dreams of the individual Americans, we are afraid of uh, the U.S. being the sole superpower in the wake of the Cold War. And therefore, that's going to be done at the cost of the rise of other major powers, the emerging markets, right? Daniel Bell. I'm Canadian, and we love to criticize the U.S. But having said that, I mean, the fact that the U.S. has military hegemony over Canada you know, means that Canada can do other stuff, pursue more social welfare and so on. So, it's, it, so if China can um, assure its neighbors that its military superiority can actually help them focus on non-military matters that are more important ultimately, then, you know, that, that could be a win-win situation for all. What do you think of the importance of, uh, you know, having common dreams? I couldn't agree more from, uh, with you from a theoretical point of view, but the fact is if you were born alone in a forest, you would have no natural rights. We collectively all right, in, impose, uh, believe, we, our dream is what he's talking about. It's the aspirations towards having something more than just pure selfishness where I want what you have and I take it. It's a civilized society. These are the aspirations that we have, but the reality is unless you are willing to work for those, all right, they will not happen. If not you, then who? Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Dialogue Special coming to you from the Yuanlu Academy, Hunan Province. I'm Yang Rei. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go away. Welcome back. You are watching Dialogue Special coming to you from the Yuanlu Academy, Hunan Province. In our probe and search for the essence of the Chinese dreams, the younger generation in China should make their due contributions. Next, let's hear what they got to say. Let's hear how they look at the Chinese dream. It's time for you guys to raise your questions, please. All right, so many people want to have their voice heard. China has become very far in the past few decades. Socially and economically, it has, made, it has done more to elevate its people and further its economy than any country in its history during such a short time. However, unfortunately, all of this was built upon some highly debatable, although arguably necessary policies, such as we've discussed the one-child policy, 
such as the suppression of some human freedom, censorship, and to a large degree the building of a cult of personality around its prime leaders. With the advent of the Chinese dream, it becomes clear that there's a new direction and fresh new thinking on the way. And I believe to achieve this, there needs to be some changes. People are increasingly demanding more government responsiveness, more transparency, and a lot more information. So my question is to Prof Professor Du and to the rest of the panel, how should the government address this in the future? How far do you think they should go? All right. I'd like to ask a question. What country would you point to that has the, the would be the model for what you would Has you all the good things without yes. any bad things. Yeah, without all the bad things. Uh, actually, that's, no, you're asking the wrong question because <laughs> in my personal opinion, to become even more perfect, there are some things that can change and to make it even better. Uh, I ran campaigns in the U.S. I saw w how the actual system works and I was, part of, I was part of the cogs in the wheel. I can assure you it's very, very little different from what you say. Cult of personality. We spent two billion dollars electing one president. All right. You want to talk about uh, corruption? We have organized and made it legal by calling lobbying. All right. Every country has its own approach to doing these things. China's not perfect, but the issue is there probably isn't this place that you're looking for. But I agree with you. Aspirationally, every country and every person, if they want this better society, has to be willing to work for it. Uh, Anna, let me try to address this issue. I think uh, it's not necessary for us to be ap apologetic no. about what I'm Chinese not being apologetic. No, no, I, mean, I don't know where you find this. No, no, no. I, I think uh, <laughs> the question addresses many different kinds of dream. I think one dream very widely embraced by Ch young Chinese, not just in Shanghai, is uh, Chinese cosmopolitanism. Allow China to be open to many different ideas, different world. Another one is the power of civility, not just the power of control or manipulation. Mm -hmm. power, power of civility. Another one is that we need to have a ca capitalism that is not only responsible, but also responsive to the various kinds of demands. I think the society has to be controlled. You know, we, we, everybody thinks security, and security is very important. In America now, you go to a security check, you're naked, right? So, but don't use security as an excuse for doing more than you need to do. In other words, we need the net to be freer, we need social media to be freer. We need more communication. We need people who are outsiders to feel this is actually uh, freer than many other countries we've been. I think China, either in terms of perception or in terms of reality, has a lot to learn. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that America has made it. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think, think it's a very so important I, question. Uh, I would like to respond to this question by means of asking the mayor a, a question. <laughs> uh, before coming to Changsha, I did a little bit of research by going to Weibo, uh, the social media, as you mentioned, and uh, I found a lot of negative or skeptical, cynical versions uh, on it. But in case we can hear everybody from Changsha, my question for you, the Mr. Mayor, is you think the majority, the mainstream voice, or the silent majority, their voice, if heard, is a positive one or a negative one? Is a constructive one or a cynical one? My hunch, my bet would be it's, the, it's a po positive voice. But it, so therefore, it's, sometimes I feel it's unfortunate for the government or for some local officials you know, to put a lid on a, in the name of stability. But there's a responsibility that is necessary to, or to having rights. You cannot yell fire in a, in a theater because you want to. You can't uh, accuse somebody of, of some salacious act just because you, yeah. you want to get back at them. No There's issue got with to be that. responsibility to the exercise on this, of rights. Uh, topic of Chinese dreams. Sorry. Negative voice will become the majority voice or the, the positive voice? I think first of all, if you talk about majority, uh, of course it's positive. But then uh, if you look at the internet, there are a lot of uh, negative uh, critis uh, criticism to me, to the government. And uh, I think that is, this is a free society. People have the right to criticize the government. People 
uh, demonstrating in front of my office. Sometimes uh, today you have 200 people because they are not satisfied with one policy. They sometimes even walk in my office. But in the United States, yeah, if you go to uh, some buildings, you'll be arrested. Yes. And in this case, I thought the freedom is much more than uh, the case you, you mentioned. Uh, I have a question for the first speaker, Daniel. Nowadays, there's a very se severe issue here. That's the degeneration of morality. We cannot deny it, Al although I am a Chinese girl. But I still want, to, want, want us to confront this question. That's the, I think it's very serious in our today's society. So as a son in law of China, what do you think the real problem is? And what can we do as a Chinese people and what our government can do to solve this problem? Moral degeneration or moral decline, is that a serious uh, crisis here? I think once uh, the government provides more of a social safety net and once, once there's less of a a kind of uh, idea that to, to make it I have to be, have this ultra competitive relationship to other people then I think um, it'll be easier to extend family love and empathy uh, to non-family members. You come up with a, a point that in China we have much more to live on but less to live for. Let's go to India where you know religious beliefs are widely accepted by different social groups. Do you have a, a crisis issue like a moral decline? Uh, during the phase of uh, social and economic transformation? I would like to define morality in slightly broader terms. It's not just uh, relationships between two human beings. It's also relationship between a human being and a broader uh, number of human beings. For example, we have certain uh, theologies, uh, certain people who believe that they're superior to other people and who believe that they have the right to use violence, they have the right to impose their own views on other people, in every which way. Now, maybe in terms of personal morality, they may not be doing much. But in terms of a broader morality, this is absolutely impermissible. So I would request my young friend to define morality in a much broader context. And the core value of morality is making people around you comfortable, making people around you happier. In other words, harmony. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of this very meaningful discussion about Chinese dream. Without your participation, Chinese dream will not be realized. Thank you very much again. <laughs> That's the end of our dialogue session coming to you from the Yale Academy, Sudan Province. I'll see you next time, back in Beijing. Goodbye. <laughs>